Your majesty and lady to expostulate what beauty is, what majesty should be, why day is day, night, night, and time, time, to nothing but to waste day, night, and time, therefore, since brevity is the soul of wit and tediousness merely flims and outward flourishes, I will be brief. I started the 420 Foundation and the 420 Rally as a way to reach out to pot smokers in New Hampshire and also to reach out to libertarians of uh, elsewhere in America and you know let them know that we're doing stuff here. We started out most of the people who had done civil disobedience in the past had called the police and said I'm gonna be out here on this date at this time and I'm gonna be you know holding a butt of weed or whatever come and arrest me and I decided not to do it that way. I just started going out on the square every day and smoking a joint with a couple of friends and we started telling our friends you know hey we're gonna be smoking a joint on the, on the square at 420 every day, so anytime you want to get high at 420, come on by the square, we'll smoke you out. And that this was eventually going to grow into a protest, but at first it was just a bunch of people smoking. And as time went on, we got up to where we had 30 people in there. And, uh, you know, I added political content by adding the opening that you probably caught. And I, as you can tell from the opening, the 420 Foundation is not an explicitly anarchist uh, organization, it's an issue organization, because I wanted as many people as possible standing behind that banner with me so that I could then reach out to them on, on other issues. So we got up to about 30 people and a reporter from the uh, union leader just happened to be wandering by the square while we're out there smoking and she was in town as luck would have it covering a marijuana legalization issue at the Keene uh, City Council and she knew she had a front page spot. We knew we were going to be front page in Manchester the following day and the union leader is also widely read in Keene so we knew we'd be all over there which meant a couple of things. A we were going to have a big police presence um, and B we were probably going to have an uptick in attendees, and that did happen. We had 150 people out the afternoon that the story broke, and this was in a town of 35,000. This is a small town. They had 28 police officers. So we had them five to one on sheer numbers. Now, obviously, they have guns, and the guns have more than five bullets, so if they decided to be really nasty, you know, they probably could have dealt with this pretty easily, but I didn't think they were going to do that. They came out and at first there were no arrests. The police were out there for three days with us before they made arrests. And the first arrest was me. And it happened because there was, <laughs> there was a, uh, the police were putting out the, the misinformation that we were just rolling tobacco and smoking that out there and we weren't really smoking weed and that's why they weren't making any arrests and that wasn't true. So I saw three newspaper photographers sitting on a bench and I went up to them and I said, you know, you guys have been to journalism school, you know what weed smells like. And they said, yeah. I said, well, you know, is it okay if I blow some of this in your direction so you can tell your colleagues what we're really smoking out here? And they said, sure. And so I blew some at them and then the cop came wandering by and I blew some at him. And uh, he didn't like that. He arrested me. But that was when they finally made an arrest, is when they knew they could not deny that we were actually doing civil disobedience out there. It was an amazing experience, you know, getting booked through for that, because as I'm getting booked, a hundred of these people from the rally have marched down to the police station. So the cop and I are listening to them outside the walls, and we can hear them through the relatively solid police station walls chanting, Free Rich Paul! Free Rich Paul! And it was just absolutely amazing. And the cops look at all, all skittish and sheepish, like, you know, what am I really doing here? Am I on the right side of this thing? It was really kind of a spiritual experience for me. I remember pacing back and forth in the cell and, and thinking, wow, that plan worked perfectly. And then reflecting on how many, how few people had probably had that thought while pacing in that particular cell, you know. But uh, civil disobedience is a funny thing. I liken it to poking a bear with a sharp stick in order to illustrate the danger of keeping and arming bears. The rub is that the demonstration is effective if and only if the demonstrator is mauled. 
Um, <laughs> and that can be unpleasant. So basically the outcome of the 420 rally was that the uh, teen, uh, the Keen Town Square became basically a demilitarized zone for a couple of years in the war on drugs. We had very little police presence out there. We, w we used to have nightcaps where we'd be out there drinking beer and smoking joints and waving at the cops as they, as they drove by and saying, come on, have a beer with us, and they wouldn't come. They just wouldn't come because they were so sick of going out there and having people not be afraid of them. It drives them crazy. <laughs> This 101 Reasons pre-release video is brought to you by... We'd like to invite you to visit Freekeen.com. Freekeen.com features audio, video, and blogs chronicling the transition to a voluntary society. Freekeen.com also has comments and discussion forums so you can be heard. Freekeen.com. I should be in Keene, New Hampshire with the Free Staters.